I'm here today with Glenn recording this for posterity because I don't want to lose the ideas that are involved here. But um, yesterday I put something on Twitter that I think created a stir, at least for me. And what I put on Twitter was this, I'm trying this on for size. Discussion, anybody? Entropy is the price we pay for the layer of computational reducibility. And then I put in parentheses, see Stephen Wolfram. Meaning, see Stephen Wolfram for a discussion of what is computational reducibility and what is computational irreducibility. Mm -hmm. But I can't quite remember what I was thinking about when I got on this trail of entropy is the price we pay for the layer of computational reducibility. Um, that's why I fanned it out to you and Michael, because you guys know the inside of my head better than <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I wanted to pick your brain on this, and you sent me a couple of wonderful letters, um, which I'm still trying to process, but I wanted to, um, you can still see me, right? I'm looking at my notes here, but I, yep. exactly yeah, I can still see you. You're, you okay. look a lot better than I do. I okay. need to do something about the lighting in this closet. So, well, your lighting actually looks good. Um, anyway, I made some notes here to just remind, try to walk through the way I'm thinking about things, and then you can tell me where I got mixed up, okay? My understanding from what Stephen Wolfram said is that the layer of, that, that most everything in his theory of everything is computationally irreducible. You just have to run it until the end of time right. to see where it ends up. But that, you know, he said, you know, sort of a lucky happenstance, there's a layer of computational reducibility in there, which is what allows us to do science. It allows us yeah. to measure and analyze and predict and Without mm -hmm. that layer of computational reducibility, we wouldn't be able to improve our lives on this planet or see any sort of progress in yeah. technology or science. Okay. Life would be magic. We'd be a Hogwarts instead of yeah. so, you see. So I'm thinking about now, where does life come into this? And earlier, this guy named Hyun Chu, who I just had a conversation with, he tweeted out that agency is the ability to independently introduce unpredictability into the system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought, yeah, that sounds right. Okay. And then Griswold Grimm tweeted out, objective morality is anti-entropic. So I was processing those two things when I came up with this little word picture of mine, that entropy is the price we pay for the layer of computational reducibility. So now I'm thinking, okay, how does entropy relate to computational reducibility? And I'm gonna tell you what I'm thinking and then you tell me where I'm wrong. Okay. Entropy can be calculated based on the amount of work done, right? That's how we calculate it. Mm, heat transfer. Because it's a measure of the free energy no longer available to do work. Is that right? Right. Right. Now, um, Carl Friston, when he talks about the free energy principle, he uh -huh. says that the free energy, now I don't know if that's the same free energy as the entropy free energy. Yeah, well, he's, he's using it in that same sense, yeah. Okay, so he says that the free energy principle says that life seeks to minimize free energy. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, would we say life is anti-entropic? Uh, yeah, because you're going against the normal tendency for things to disorder themselves. So yeah, it's, it's an active choice. Well, but it seems to me that the way life works, that life, that as, as life is coming into being from sperm and egg up to like a human mm -hmm. being or up to like a full grown animal or whatever, that is completely anti-entropic. Right. And once the child is born, there's an anti-entropic side and an entropic side because everything also starts to disintegrate, right? Right. But 
you 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 can't focus on just the individual. You know, there's a whole species, there's a whole society, there's a whole one animal doesn't survive by itself. There's you know, so part of the anti and entropic process is uh, generational continuation. You know, having babies and raising families and social structure and hunting and surviving and eating. And so if you kind of expand your focus out and look at the, 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 the whole, the bigger picture, you know, the forest rather than the trees, there's a whole other anti-entropic process going on, which is keeping the species alive and reproducing. So that is, is, a, is a computational process. There's a consciousness there of some kind um, an intelligence thinking, it's a group intelligence, like an ant colony. Uh, that's, that's usually the standard in AI, I think, one of them, for a group intelligence, where the colony can go on for, I don't know, 50 years. They can replace the queen, even though the ants themselves might only live a few weeks, or I think some species, they might live a year. So the colony survives, even though the individuals come and go. So, so, they're, a, so they're exercising agency. Yeah, every, yeah. Okay, so and, I, should, I should clarify at this point that the reason this is important is when I tweeted that out, Jordan Peterson linked to it and he said, explain. <laughs> so now I have to find a way to explain it. So, so what was he thinking about when he asked that question? Something well, must have sparked you, you know, the, your, the interest in that tweet. Well, I've been listening to a lot of his conversations lately, and I might, I might be wrong, but I think um, I, I was re-listening to the conversation he was having with Ian McGilchrist, and me, Ian McGilchrist, I really like a lot of what he says, but Ian McGilchrist is very much, um, you don't need to have objective morality and um, there's no need to really try to nail things down and, and think about God. But the main thing is that we need to have more freedom in our thinking and get away from propositional thinking and allow ourselves more into this right hemisphere kind of um, artistic, poetic thinking yeah. of the world, mm -hmm. which is which is all well and fine, but I understand why Jordan Peterson is trying to find out inside of Ian McGilchrist's thinking, where is the place for that which holds things together? Because if you go too far down that other road, and even McGilchrist acknowledges this, you end up falling over into postmodernism or over into this kind of anchor, anchorless yeah. world. And so I'm li I listened to that conversation. I listened to a conversation he had with Paul Vanderclay a couple of years ago. And in all of those, he indicates that he's searching for where can you find God in science? When he talks to all these scientists, I can tell from the questions he's asking them. And um, he's trying to understand the structure of the universe and how that fits together with his picture of this hierarchical structure of, of being. You know, he considers being to be good. And, and how does that fit in? I well, that's what he's looking for. That's what I'm looking at. But this would be a long camp, probably fit it in a tweet. But two <laughs> comments came up, you know, thoughts just when you were talking. One, you know, that, that notion that propositional way of thinking is, is outdated and, and stunting and, and kind of a dead end and we need to more, be more fluid. That might make sense if you're a, a thinker, but the minute you make a choice to do something, you have made a binary yes, no, you know, action. So you can talk, you know, you can be as creative as you want, but the day or the moment comes when you have to make a choice, then everything does reduce down to yes, no, true, false, go, stop. And so I'm thinking in, in life, people who tend to be doers tend to probably think more in terms of yes, no. 
and people who are artists and less inclined to actually be functional in the real world are, are free to be more fluid in their, their thinking. So that might, there might be a hint as to the political divide there, I don't know. But so, yeah, I, that would be the, the thing I would say to Jordan Peterson at that point is, Gilchrist can say that, but it's someday he has to make a decision. What are you going to do? And at that point, everything collapses down to yes, no. I mean, kind of reminiscent of, of quantum versus classical, where the wave function can be an infinite number of different things until you measure it, at which point it collapses down to one thing. Uh, so that's rambling on that one. No, it's not rambling. That is that's exactly gets at it because you know, from Peterson's point of view, action is um, action is how we yes how we learn, how we grow, how we know, how we interact with the world. It all has to happen through action because it's when I enter into that next moment that I find out what moment this meaning has this moment has or all the moments before or the potential moments of the future. I don't find that out until I interact with something. Mm -hmm. I can spend all day thinking, but it's not going to get me anywhere until I go out and clean a toilet or, <laughs> you know, or throw well, in some power. way that's, that's, that's the layman's version of uh, computational um, irreducibility is that at some point you have to make that decision, but you don't know what it's going to be until you do it. You know, you don't know if you run the calculations, you run the program, but you don't know what it's going to do until you run it and run it out and see what happens. So that's how you experience that in your, in your life is the future is undecided until you get there. And you don't know, there's no way to predict ahead of time. The future is no undecided there. until you act. Yes. Right? Now, and, and, and when you act, put, to put it in Peterson's framework, um, everything is we're trying to go from A to B. Well, first of all, we have to val have a value structure to even care about whether or not we get to B, because B has to be better than A, otherwise I wouldn't be going there. Yeah. But I'm on my way to from A to B. And something happens, some anomaly, some unknown thing happens that throws everything in a tailspin. And in my mind, it's sort of that anomaly that makes things computationally irreducible. If I, if I could know that I would get from A to B on a certain path based on a certain set of parameters and a certain set of physical laws, and I would know exactly the path and I'm going to get there, then it would be computationally reducible, right? Yeah. Okay. But the, pro the reason that you can think through it step by step in the first place is an, is a, an example of computational irreducibility. Because if your mind, if your thought process was de deterministic, determined already ahead of time, then you couldn't think anything that wasn't already predicted. So I, I think this is the Sam Harris view that, that we think that we're thinking, but it's all been just programmed into us ahead of time from the beginning of the universe, then there is no choice. So the fact that you can make a choice, a yes, no, and then act on it is, is the irre irreducibility in, in action. So, because if so, life so was not- that would, was, be, that would be the agency thing, right? Yeah. If life was, if everything was reducible, then your choices would be predicted ahead of time and you wouldn't really have a choice. So you would just be an actor in a play already written. And some people think that's way. I mean, that's, that's equivalent to saying when you live in the matrix. And you can't prove you don't live in the matrix. So don't try it. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens too. But here's the thing that we've been kind of talking about language and, and uh, computation. When you create a painting, it's a sequence of choices guided by some set of rules or intuition. So it's your choices, step by step, which bring the painting into a physical reality. Mm -hmm. 
So computation at its crudest sense, you know, people just think computers, well, that's not anything, but you as a entity taking input, making choices, sometimes you get close, sometimes you're far away, you know, kind of a stochastic, but you gradually home in on what it is you're trying to do. And in the process, you've brought something that was just an idea into physical space. And so that's the question, is, is art discovered or invented? Is math discovered or invented? Um, if you want to go on the side of music is discovered, then how is the process that we discover it? It's a step-by-step. -step. If you want to discover a new land, you get in a boat, you cross the sea, you, you get on a horse, you climb mountains. There's the same thing intellectually going on step-by-step uh, -step that we move forward and why sometimes intuition, sometimes good guessing. Um, I like to think that um, it's a combination of pattern recognition and anomaly. We, we sense there's patterns around us. We, we can't always put them all together, but then we noticed also that that pattern would fit, but except for this little thing over here, and then that draws our attention. And I, I always think of you when, when I think that way, because that's how you describe your art. Mm -hmm. But something is pulling us forward. And so what makes you do your art is the same thing that caused the first life form to cre be created. Something is out there pulling us forward. We somehow recognize it. We make choices. We make good guesses. And we gradually take what's an idea and turn it into physical reality. And so I, somewhere in there, I think that's what Jordan Peterson is looking at. That's why choices are important. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's the very act of create, being creative is, yes, is making and, choices. And um, to be able to come, you know, you know how... Um, oh, no, yeah, I'm giving you a headache. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm just trying to put together an idea here. To be able to come to that recognition but to come to that recognition from outside the system so to speak um jordan peterson is trying to come to this conclusion but from outside the religious system right not using any of the um any of the principles or propositions that are inside the system i think this is one of the reasons he's so interested in girdle yeah. Right. That outside of every system, there has to be, and and that's your whole idea of strong emergence, right? Exactly. That, strong that emergence. Even outside this system, there has to be something that is drawing us up to the next level, or that well, there wouldn't be a next level, right? Right. And whatever that next level is, is not. You can't get there directly from here. You got to jump to it, and that's that's the irreducibility part. You can you take that leap. You know, that's, like, that's the Nima Arkani Hamed second mountain. Yeah, that's how you get there. Mm -hmm. You have to climb down from one and then take a jump to the next one. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be guided by some intuition. You don't know what's ahead. You see a pattern. You see something that fits, something that's kind of pulling you. Um, like I was explaining in one of my emails, that part of the creative process is, is a longing and a motive. Uh, something gets you, something makes you want to go and get up and do. And doing is the process of making choices and making something physical. If you just sit and think about stuff, that's not a creative process. Mm -hmm. So on the morality side, does society value creativity? If society wants to, as we as a people, society as a life form, value the creative aspect of our, our existence. You know, I like to think that's God's, that's God's image in us is our ability to create. Um, and so if you wanna be creative, then like Nima Harkani Hamed pointed out to you, there's certain things you, you've gotta to stick to and that's the truth. And you have to religiously stick to the truth. And there has to be conversation. You have to be able to talk and work and debate. Um, but, 
if you're not seeking the truth, you can go off on all sorts of directions which are not creative, which are destructive, which tear things down and, and destroy order. So, okay, so creativity is creativity minimizes free energy. Well, I guess you could say that. I would. Well, I mean, if, creati if creativity, does creativity create order rather than disorder? Well, it creates order locally and- And, and disorder globally. That's Yes, exactly well, when you do a painting, you know, here, so. there's a mess somewhere, you know, when you cook dinner, the meal is great, but there's a mess in the kitchen to clean up. Yeah, yeah so. so that's what I was thinking about. I, this is part of what I've got written here is that, the creation of life decreases entropy locally, but the living of life increases entropy globally. Right. Okay. And then, um, in but that's it, not the point of life. That's just one of the side results of life. I but, think. But, but what I'm trying to understand is: is there some way in which that increase of disorder globally? is required in order for us to be able to decrease disorder locally. And um, Michael sent me a very interesting email because I think Michael is able to get inside my head. <laughs> and and uh, here's this email from Michael. Um, let me see if I can find it quick here. Yeah, so Michael says, um, what I hear you gesturing at is this dynamic between our real but limited free will with God's ultimate sovereignty, such that being can be ultimately good, and yet our limited agency is still real. There has to be some cost to this. Conceiving of it as entropy is interesting, like there is this extra layer of complexity that is introduced as a further space for a later resolution of the temporal, moral distortion that is brought about by our agency. And I think what he means there is we screw things up, you know, <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. The layer of computational reducibility seems to be an absolute necessity for us as finite creatures to make choices that are meaningfully directed toward a goal of our choosing, whether good or bad. Because, you know, from a, inside the system, we believe that God has given us free will to choose the good or the bad, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting thing to contemplate what are the costs of these sort of artificial restrictions for our sake. But it seems to me hard to posit any sort of ultimate resolution to what is set in motion within our little time frames of our stories without looking forward to the resurrection. It feels like entropy is one of the things that ultimately leads to our death, which, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah right. There is a Bulgakov essay on the sociology of death that I think is a useful foray into the mystery of death within an Orthodox Christian perspective, and it might be something worth pointing Chris Peterson towards. So that was what Michael said. And, and that I had something like that in my mind that, mm -hmm. that um, the increase of disorder, if I think of the whole universe being gods, okay, the, it's not that, it's not like pantheism where everything is God, but everything is in God. I mean, God's capacity is far beyond the size of the universe, but this little universe is inside of God. But th still that means that if disorder is increasing all over the universe because of our actions, then there's some cost to that. So the fact that it's permitted seems to me to be a gift. Yeah, I think I would use that term. But I, I tend to to think in terms of forgetfulness. Yeah, that, I also had that in my mind. So let's right. go over that forgetfulness thing again. Yeah, that when they talk about disorder, that's a, 
a, a final state. You have to have some global knowledge in order to talk about a disordered system. You have to know some global knowledge about what the system is and where it's going and what its ultimate place is going to be. But nobody or no entity has that. Um, there's more oh, final so you, states wait available. A minute. You, you need a global knowledge in order to determine yeah, if mathematically, it's disorder yeah. or order. Yeah, if you're playing, if you're playing with the mathematics of disorder, you need to know what the whole system is to to make sense out of the equations. At least, you know, the kinetic theory of gases, um, statistical mechanical approach assumes somewhere in there that you know what the system is. So you can count states and then you know, play the probability game. But in the real world, we don't have that. Nothing, nothing has it. The sun, nobody knows it. No atom, no molecule knows what all the possible final states are. Everything is reacting in the local conditions that are currently there. So whatever process is happening, I find it easier, more useful to look at it in terms of what's happening locally without reference to any downstream consequences. And I find the word forgetfulness is, it works pretty good there. You're losing information on, on, you know, as every step goes by of the world around you and what things were around you. And what ultimately, you know, if you lose all information, then you're in a state of maximum disorder. But most of life and most of the universe is not in equilibrium. So it's always, been a question how much the statistical mechanics approach really applies in a lot of systems. So I um, mean in terms of you know dynamics and stars and who knows where. But isn't that that's also part of what they talk about when they discuss complexity, right? Is that they're looking at it from the standpoint of of um, disequilibrium rather than equilibrium. Right. But if you walk out into that world then you're like I say, you're getting into the world where you have to look at the actual processes happening rather than just counting states, which doesn't tell you anything about what's actually happening locally. But what is the dynamics? What are the forces? What is, what is coming in and going out? You know, when you talk about a gas in a box, but then you neglect the walls of the box, the insulation. And then the walls of the box are interacting with the universe outside. So um, there's a, I don't know, I just find forgetfulness is a much better term. And in which case, I, I think I said in my email that you could say forgetfulness is the gift that allows consciousness to exist. Because if you can't erase your memory, you, everybody gets stuck real fast and computation ends. That's essentially Landauer's principle, one way to restate it. So if, if the universe couldn't forget, as soon as something was created, it might just fall apart again because it would re remember where it came from and it might just want to go back there. So it's kind of like if you want to make, like when the conquistador, some of them, the stories I heard, they came and they burned the ships so that people wouldn't want to go back when things got tough. And, you know, in a sense, that's what entropy does. You know, we create something new, and then the process, the scaffolding that got us there is destroyed. And that's forgetfulness. If we didn't have that, nothing could go forward. So well, does that make in, sense? In other words, we'd end up on a, a, a pendulum of forward and time going forward, yeah. and going backward, time going forward and time going backward. It's a you know we'd be on this frictionless roller coaster just yeah. going back and forth between chaos and creation and slide back and forth. Um, uh, entropy or you know, it's it's a, it allows you to go up and then somehow get stuck, and then you lose your extra energy. Now you can't get back. So. Well, so when I said when I made this ridiculous tweet and I said. Um, Entropy is the price we pay for the layer of computational reducibility. Um, 
the, the, the layer of computational reducibility is the gift that exists inside the system that allows us to be deterministic in our scientific endeavors. Right, yeah. Okay. And um, that's the layer of computational reducibility. And this forgetfulness, So in a way, it makes sense because the forgetfulness is the price we pay. If, if, um, if we didn't have the forgetfulness, everything would be computationally irreducible and, and there would be this back and forth thing going on because we wouldn't. No, everything would, would be reducible. So that's one of the things Landauer's principle. If, you, if, if the computer remembered every step that it took, then it could go backwards. The fact that an AND gate takes two inputs and has one output, every time an AND function is executed, information is, is lost. But there's a thing called a Fredekin gate or something like that. It, it remembers. You can go, always go backwards. But eventually, you have remembered so much that your computer's memory fills up, and now you're stuck. So every step in the computational process that involves a, a logic gate of some sort loses information and then becomes irre, irreproducible. You can't go backwards now. You can't go back to the inputs knowing from the outputs. But if you remembered everything, then you could. I don't know if that helps. That might have been just. No, no. So I, I think I get it. So the the forgetfulness is what allows computational reducibility. Irreducibility. Irreducibility. You can't go backwards. It's unre it's unreproducible. Unre unreducible. Forgetfulness. You can't reverse engineer it. So forgetfulness is what makes irreducibility possible or right. is what makes irreducibility inevitable. Or they're, they're equivalent statements. Maybe that's a better way to say it. What I say is what makes irreducibility inevitable or what makes irreducibil irreducibility possible? Uh, I would go, I would think that Stephen Wolfram would agree that Irreducibility is somehow cooked into the laws of the universe right from the start. Cooked into the flaw? It's 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 baked into it's part of creation. It's it's you know, we have conservation of energy, conservation, we call them these laws. Well, this apparent irre irreducibility of computation is one of those features of our universe, which is just, like I say, baked in in the recipe right from the start. Well, but wait a minute. So, yeah. but what I don't get is I thought that most of these physicists today thought like um, Sam Harris, well, maybe he's not a physicist, he's a neuroscientist. Neuroscientist. Yeah, I thought that most of those guys thought that the whole universe was completely predictable and deterministic. But right, but say, Stephen Wolfram would disagree. He, so, okay, so he is on the other side of that. Okay. Yeah, That's Stephen true. is on the other side. And yeah. yeah, he's... Yeah, yeah so, and, so and, when Stephen says that irreducibility is cooked into the laws of the universe at the beginning, he's saying something a little bit radical in the scientific community. Yes, yes. Okay. Qualitatively, that's, that's fundamentally I, different. He's out in, on his own. And I'm, I'm on his train, you know, I'm, I'm on that side of the fence. So. Okay. And irreducibility... Um, Forgetfulness is a necessary consequence of irreducibility, or is it uh, what drives irreducibility? It's a consequence of, it's part and parcel of, it's, we, when you have the ability to make a choice um, between you know, door, door A and door B, 
Um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the words. Uh-huh. That choice, I've talked about it before, it's a free choice, is, is the physics term. And it comes up in quantum mechanics when you're talking about uh, Alice and Bob you know, making measurements on quantum systems. Oh, are there choices of what measurement to make free? In other words, they can make a choice which is not predictable by the past history of the universe. So if you can do that, you can choose different futures. Now, we don't know what's going to happen until you, you make that choice. But somehow forgetfulness, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing I'm trying to get at, is how does this entropy thing, this forgetfulness thing, fit into that ability to make choices, which I guess we would call agency. Agency is that ability to pick between possible futures. Maybe pick between possible. Right. And if you have that ability, then the future is partly your responsibility. And that's when you become a moral agent. And and if people just went on making these choices, but they could always remember how they got to the choice that they made then they could turn around and go back to the starting gate and do it over again. Mm -hmm. But what happens is once you've made so many choices, the- The world is scrambled now and you can't put the, you can't unwhip the egg. Because because the information gets lost. Yes, the information you need to go backwards is now lost. But that information that you need to go backwards is lost because is, is it lost because of the increase in entropy or is that equivalent to the increase in entropy? Uh, well, there's, there's the entropy that we're doing and then there's the entropy that's just going on around us all the time. You know, I think sometimes these discussions focus too much on us and we forget mm-hmm. that we're just part of this big physical universe and everything that we're experiencing, all the world around us. So the molecules in the wall are, are moving. Um, things are happening outside. The world is changing. So even if I remembered everything I did, the world has changed now. So I can't go back and you know, put the world back together. The world's doing its own thing too. It's, it's randomizing. Um, well, and so the whole universe is also moving moving <laughs> yeah whole it's kind of getting moving it's all going around and moving and so there's no way to get back to where you yeah were. so yeah locally you, you could probably you know control things but your existence depends on so many things outside of you and we don't always pay attention to that that our our lives aren't about us necessarily and we affect everything around us as well so uh so anyway, okay, have, so, so would be any closer would, to an answer? Where would you put, when you think of computational reducibility, what do you think of? Uh, I think of brute behaviors, you know, um, I guess the, the ant calling, because I'm, I'm in robotics and I'm working with, you know, distributed intelligence systems right now. The thing that fascinates me is a, a single computer, a single embedded processor running is reducible. You can look at it, you can read the programs, it's all knowable. But if you stick a bunch of processors together into kind of a swarm situation, group behaviors can now manifest themselves, which were not predictable beforehand just knowing the source code for you know the better processes so that's what i'm fascinated about and i think in some sense maybe that's where stephen wolfram is is looking at too is this phenomenon where um, distributed intelligence systems can all t- all of a sudden take on behavior patterns which are not predictable ahead of time and then that gives you some new kind of structure out there, which can now become an entity 
the building block yet in another level of, of emergence. So this is, um, we're describing the process of emergence. So Strong the, emergence. So machinery is computationally reducible because right. you know how you built it, you know what it's going to do, it, you know where the mm -hmm. pieces are going to fit together, you know how much entropy is going to be produced by the working of that machine. Right. Right. You got then you put a thousand machines out there and let them talk to each other. <laughs> and who knows what's going to happen. Uh huh. That and that's a real phenomenon. And I, I mean, people are fascinated by it because it really happens. And people are trying to understand it. And Stephen Wolfram is trying to understand it. And in that phenomena, he sees a way to look at the origins of life and consciousness. Mm -hmm. But something has, there has to be a break between the, the basic laws of physics and the creation of higher orders. Um, because otherwise we would be completely governed by the laws of physics. And I don't think we would have the act, ability to have a choice. So. So you're, you're thinking that the fact that we have consciousness actually makes us one layer up in strong emergence above the physical. Yeah, I would say several, probably multiple layers. I've, I've never sat down and tried to figure it out, but I'm sure you could pick out multiple layers of emergence, starting from atoms up to cells, to proteins, to DNA, RNA, you know, molecules. And DNA is the memory and the RNA is the processor, um, computational little engines. But I mean, what I'm saying is from your standpoint, the, the way strong emergence works is that there is something drawing you up from the, uh, the lower layer up. And yeah. Robert Piercing with, with Sevilla King's thing, that would be, her word is quality. But right. the, the some of the, like, I've been listening to some stuff on Aristotle and he was looking at words like the one, the true, the good. The, yeah, the logos. The, well, the, the one, the true, the good, and the beautiful are the things that are, are um, this drawing up kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I need to take better notes. I mean, I need to go back over my notes and really get at that. But I think that Sevilla's word quality, I think in this other, worldview would be like the one, the true, and the good. Yeah. Um, and that there is something above that's drawing us up from this. There's something below <laughs> yeah. percolating up, but then there's something above that's drawing up. And so there's this, a layer above us, which we can't get at without that, that upward leap. Mm -hmm. and, and part of what's in that layer above is beauty and creativity and and the higher mountain of Nima Arkani Hamed and and yeah the thoughts that come to physicists who have these brilliant ideas like Einstein's general relativity and, and all that that's all part of that layer above that we don't have right. access to. Is right. that what you're saying? Right. And one of the call marks of strong emergence is what's called top down causality. It's a, there's an order at a higher level, and whatever, however that order happens, it then in turn has an effect on individuals making up that group. And so there's an effect backwards, downwards, so that the group takes on different the ant colony. You know, there's a there's a higher order that keeps the colony going, which in then turn causes an evolutionary process on the individual ants as their single programming so that they're born and they have a little roles as soldiers or whatever and they combine together to form the the group consciousness which then is the colony and there's a there's a kind of a loop there mm -hmm. so um so what's a strong emergent some of the scientists when they talk about that though they talk about whatever that top-down causality is as just being uh, a natural consequence of the the structure of the colony. I mean, they don't think of it as being a layer above. They think of it as being yeah 
Freddie well, and Harry. A lot of people don't like strong emergence um, because it sounds too much, too spiritual, <laughs> too new agey. Um, so they, their, their conversations, their research, their, their discussions won't go there. Mm -hmm. But if you want to look at things that way, you know, you can you can break things down into different different ways. You can look at it as through a certain lens. You can, okay, well, I'll try strong emergence. I'll look at it this way. Uh, we do that a lot, I think, in life. You know, look at it through different glasses. Take you know, if you want to take that uh, strong emergence seriously, and then imagine what the world, how it would organize itself if you were going to use that as the paradigm to to structure things and categorize things, then that's what you see is the top-down cycle. And but I can't prove it. I can't, you know, it's just the choice you make and then you look at it and you go, wow, that, well, that so, works really good. So pragmatically, I'm trying to imagine how this actually works. Is it as though in your mind, are you seeing that the top-down level actually somehow injects possibility or potential or guidance or direction or something to the next layer down? To, to I haven't I haven't figured that one out. That's one of my to-do bucket list things. It is. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the hopes is if I get my swarm system going, that that I can see. I can leave you alone long enough. <laughs> and I can I actually watch the, you. <laughs> the group behaviors uh, start to happen. Maybe it'll give me a hint as to what to to look for. Would it help you to recruit any guys to help you with it? Because I'm sure there's a lot of geeks watching this that. <laughs> I have no idea if anyone would even understand what I'm trying to do <laughs> they probably just look at me and go you're crazy why are you wasting your time so well, they might but there might be somebody just crazy enough to say yeah i'd like to get in on that action <laughs> well who knows I, I wouldn't i wouldn't say no uh, so back to jordan peterson i think we've wandered off a bit yeah well because i'm i'm trying to wrap my head around I felt like I was on to something when I tweeted that out, but I. Uh... Well, you, you, it sparked him. So that, that means he's probably thinking about that. But when, those... when you read it, did it make sense to you at any level? Did it sound reasonable to you? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Then could you but... translate it for me in your language? <laughs> Oh boy, and entropy. fit it in 140 words? No, 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 no. Entropy is the price we pay. I, I would be the, the perennial physicist. I would go back to first principles. I would okay. say, we're misusing words. We need to go, entropy is not a thing in itself. It's a result of something more fundamental. You know, it's the, the, the desire to just, okay, well, maybe entropy is not the thing that we should be focusing on. Maybe it is the downstream consequence of something else deeper going on in the laws of physics. And once you want to, that's the step I want to take. And that gets me to where Stephen Wolfram is at. When you start saying computation is fundamental, you start there, then this notion of entropy will come out of that naturally. The arrow of time obviously gets a direction. Um, a lot of these things happen, but it's not the entropy itself. It's something more fundamental that you want to start with. And then all of these things that you're looking at are downstream consequences of that. So yeah, when I hear you say that, I know, yeah, they're related and you're getting it, that they're tied together. There, there's something there that, that is important to look at, but what's under the hood, that gets harder to explain. So now I've really messed it up. No, no, but if you do, if, if you happen to be thinking about it and you do 
get a light bulb as to what you think the critical thing is that's underneath that. Because I know I was thinking about agency and I was thinking about objective morality and objective morality. I think in my mind, I might have this wrong because I'm not a philosopher, but when I was thinking about objective morality, I was thinking about the idea that there is an eternal truth that basically is the same thing as reality and that that we are we are being called to align to that reality and that is basically the top down causality drawing us up through these layers of emergence towards this mm -hmm. final um eternal truth this objective morality that is this beautiful structure of reality mm -hmm. and that's what i was thinking of was that, that objective morality thing and agency and how they interact and that agency has an impact on um certainly has an impact on entropy but um as you said a lot of things that aren't attributed to agency also have an impact on entropy so yeah. but but then this layer of computational reducibility is the fact that it's there really benefits only us as conscious beings. That layer of computational reducibility doesn't, doesn't provide any benefit to rocks, right? No, but any life form, starting from the simplest virus on up, if you didn't have that irreducibility, you wouldn't have life. If it didn't have reducibility? Irreducibility. I'm saying reducibility. Yeah. The comp the, I'm saying the other with the opposite. The computational reducibility is what makes it possible for us to do science, the deterministic part yes. of it, mm -hmm. right? Right. So if that's a not of benefit to anybody who isn't up here with us in the conscious layer, right? right. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there is a layer of computational reducibility has to be there to benefit us. It's got yes. to be a gift. Yeah. Uh, actually, reducibility is what allows us to do physics. Yeah. Irreducibility is, is why you're here in the universe to start with, to do physics. Yes, yes. But here we are in this irreducible life that we're in which is good because then you can't predict and there's always an adventure on the next uh -huh. corner but in the middle of that messiness there is this layer of pristine rules and laws and everything that allow us to see order in the universe and allow yeah. us to see the deterministic so all of that is some kind of a gift that's at this layer of yeah. reducibility and and whenever there's a gift there's usually a cost yeah right so i was thinking that perhaps entropy is the cost hmm. <laughs> I would, I would, when i hear the word cost i think of uh, some kind of moral judgment oh that costs too much Oh no, when I when I was thinking cost, I was thinking more like um like the kind of cost where you you sacrifice today because of a better Yeah, experience. in that sense I buy it. Yeah. I'm happy with that. It's a it's a, it's a byproduct. It's a it's the waste product of, of the process of, of creation. But yeah, okay, I'm happy with the word cost. Well, so I, I could say sacrifice. Yeah, again, there's a little. But then you get a biblical thing. Yeah. Right? Then you get when, when, into the. When, when a cell is metabolizing, you know, to make energy, it's it's producing entropy, but I wouldn't say it's a sacrifice or a. That's, but yeah, yeah, I know what you know. You know what you're trying to do. I'll just shut up. No, so when a cell is metabolizing, um it's it's creating order 
which is right. creating disorder globally. Right. And as I understand it, if you could put numbers on this kind of thing, let's say a metabolizing cell is creating 100 units of order, that means out there in the universe globally, there's got to be a minus 101 because it's always got to be more than mm -hmm. what was what was the the plus side, right? So you all have is that a net gain in entropy, in other words? Right. Oh, I'm gonna have to think about that one. No well, I, I thought it wasn't an equal equal. I thought it was you always have more entropy than you have decrease in entropy. Yeah, but entropy is not it's a the same necessarily as energy. So I, I think that's the a lot of times you can use them, but they're not the same, you know. Uh, so yeah, mathematically, I, I would. I'm not comfortable jumping in on that one. Okay. Yeah, entropy does increase; energy is lost. Um, exactly what ratio uh, depends on the efficiency of the process. So yeah, that's. I think that's what. So so the the efficiency of the process would determine whether or not the the total increase in entropy would be larger than the than the decrease. Yeah, you can take energy input and turn it totally into entropy and do no useful work. So what what you're seeing with the Carnot cycle and, and stuff like that is is physics the universe has put a limit on how efficient you can be. So it says there's always be some waste. But you can be totally 100% inefficient and waste everything. So um, that's why the greater than or equal to sign is in, in the second law. So yeah, I, that's why I get a limit. little bit. That's a great statement. The universe has put a limit on how efficient you can be. But it doesn't limit how inefficient you can let yourself be. Wow. Don't I know? I mean, I guess that's why they have the TV show, My 600 Pound Life. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing the ads for that. There's this poor guy who weighs 600 pounds and somehow they've done some sort of a reality show about him, but- That would be sad. That's just so sad. And, and what has happened is, yes, there is a limit on how efficient you can be, although I'm not sure we'll ever really know what that is because Jordan Peterson is always talking about, you know, if you, could get this dialed in right, who could tell how far you could go? But there is some sort of an upper limit because we're finite human beings. Yeah. But there's no limit on how inefficient you can be because you can <laughs> stop everything and just keep eating. Yep. And um, yeah, so entropy is a little bit more fuzzy concept than energy. Um, well, as I, as I certainly know, because you've been drilling me on this for at least 20 hours, <laughs> but something is sticking in there because I have, a, I definitely have a, the picture of forgetfulness that you gave me a while back has really, um, really helped me think about a lot of things. Cause I totally, you know, I, I totally see how that works with the arrow of time and and, uh, yeah, well, in a funny way that got me on this as a physicist long ago was, was being a Lutheran and you know, Martin Luther, sin came into the world with Adam and Eve and their sin, you know, that death was not part of the world until Adam and Eve sinned. And I used to think, well, wait a second, the Garden of Eden had plants, they were growing. And so there must have been seasons, you know, and so people are saying there wasn't entropy in the Garden of Eden because there was no death. And I thought, well, no, but you need entropy to have life in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, some people wonder, you know, ask silly questions and I was asking questions like that. Well, well see, that's wasn't... a great question, isn't it? That's a great question. Yeah, so- you have entropy in order to have life. So that's what launched me on that question. What role does entropy play in the whole creative process in the first, you know, to start out with? And I was realizing if you didn't have the second law, you wouldn't have plants, you wouldn't have growth, you wouldn't have any of the things that gave life in the Garden of Eden to start with. 
So that that sounds really silly, and I wouldn't say that publicly, but uh, it was kind of meditating on that question has got me in a long ways towards where I am in terms of the physics, and then trying to make the physics fit. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe that that will help you uh, have a pathway into it. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. That I think we we covered a lot of ground. Um, you just said you wouldn't say that publicly. Does that mean you would prefer I don't publish this one? I think. Well, you could just uh, still put my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, would do you mind if I put this video out there, or would you prefer that I don't? I'm kind of, you know, part of me says, yes, go ahead. You know, who knows what's going to happen? It's all fun. And uh, I'll, I learn something, whatever happens. So, yeah. I, I, didn't I, I mean, I think there might be some other minds out there that could help us tackle this because, like you said, there is something in there that is important. But why it's important, I, I can't. Yeah. But I mean, so, Jordan Peterson wrote three books already, and he still hasn't figured it out. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's I okay wish I could just know. give him my brain and, and let him see the world through my brain for a little bit. Well, I wish he would have a conversation with you. I mean, um, I'd like to take a little clip of this if somebody would show me how to do clips and just send that to him and say, here, <laughs> chew on this for a while. <laughs> But really what I, I want him to talk to Nima Arkani Hamed about the fundamental, the morality of fundamental physics, Yeah. then the two mountains. And I want him to have a conversation with Stephen Wolfram about the layer of yeah. computational reducibility, because I think there's really something there. And um, there's, there's people I want him to have conversations with that I think would, um, good-heartedly try to help him find answers. I, I see him talking to some people who they just want to present their own ideas and he, I hear him grappling with their ideas try, and I yeah. see how he's trying to fit their ideas inside his frame but wouldn't it be better if they could just actually have a conversation if they understood enough about each other to actually have a conversation it would be so good. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, noticed, I've wondered if that's his videos lately, I get the sense he's he's looking for something. He wants to move on to the next thing, but he doesn't know what it is. And he's hoping he can talk to somebody who will help him up to that next step. And no one's really helping him. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. Because everybody has a little piece of the answer. And I'm sitting here and I see all the little pieces. And I want to say... <laughs> Here it is, it's a package, but I can't put it into a tweet thread. You know? Yeah. We've now got like on the meeting code, we've got like 250 hours or something like that. So it's not something anybody could sit down and absorb, so. Well, <clears throat> I would trust your intuition and just let come out of your, your fingers whatever wants to come out. <laughs> Okay. Don't, don't overthink it, but. Well, you know, you when you see on a tweet from Jordan Peterson, explain yourself. It's like, ah! <laughs> it scared me half to death. A math we test, were, no. We were going out to dinner with the family and I didn't have time to work on it then. And so I made a mistake of trying to make a start. So I made some kind of half form tweet and then I just gave it up in the middle. So I probably have lost my opportunity but at least you've helped me think it through. So, so maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be better prepared next time I get an opportunity like this. Okay, well, I'm sorry, I can't really help you on that. But I think you helped me a lot. Thank so you so I'm, much, Glenn, for giving me time on your Sunday afternoon. I that's okay. You. I just, I'll go get dinner now, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> bye -bye. All right. Well, take care, keep me posted. I will do that, bye-bye. Bye.